Hey everyone, thanks for joining. We're going to be getting started in just a few moments. So just go ahead and get settled in your seats. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see we got a bunch of people in the chat already. Feel free to go ahead and ask questions in there, comments, talk to each other, engage. Uh, we have moderators on the other end who can respond from Anita, or there's plenty of experienced people within the actual chat to answer questions as well, because it's always fun to engage with other people. But welcome to another Watch and Stitch. My name is Brian. I'm an educator with Anita Good Design, and today we're going to be covering a fan favorite, Namely, because it's a very quick project <clears throat> that can be made into a gift or something useful around the house. And we're going to be doing free motion cork coasters. So if you haven't uh, watched any of my videos before, uh, educational videos, things I like to talk about are not just what we're doing, because I don't want you to get this particular design, watch this, make it, and then say, okay, I know how to make a coaster. Really what we're going to be learning here is a couple different things, but two principal techniques. One is going to be just standard embroidery. You know, just putting your thread on the machine, navigating your interface, and letting our digitizing do the work. The second is we're going to learn standard applique. Now, we're going to be utilizing those two techniques to create a freestanding object. So before we get started today, I'd like to go ahead and just kick off this whole thing by giving away a prize immediately. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you a word. You're just going to type it into the comments and we'll pick a winner for a $20 gift card that you can use online for any of our standard retail product very soon. So the word I'd like you to go ahead and uh, type into the comments is cork. You can type cork in there and we'll pick a winner here in just a few. All right, so while that's going on, um, let me also remind you that um, this video will be replayable. So once it's done, if uh, you know, you just want to watch me at my speed, that's fine, but you'll be able to go back and rewatch this as many times as you need to, especially if you're new, to follow right along with me as we complete this project. So with the project, you know, you may be watching this video deciding whether or not you actually want to get this particular watch and stitch, um, which also you can go on and get all of September's watch and stitch in every previous month just by purchasing them individually, and you'll have the videos from us educators still on the YouTube to follow along with them. So this month's watch and stitch, or today's rather, is going to be the free motion cork coasters. So I've gone ahead and printed off the tutorial that comes along with it. Now, the first thing you're going to notice about our tutorials is they're generally structured the same way. So with the tutorials, um, essentially the very first page, when it comes to like projects, you're going to have what you'll need, essentially your materials list. So on here you can see we have a tearaway stabilizer, um, you can use water soluble, but I don't quite recommend it with cork if it's dyed cork because it will run. Um, there is uh, certain corks that uh, may be color safe, but uh, most of the time I find with what I buy, the actual dyed cork can bleed. And I'll kind of touch on how that can mess things up later on as well and how to prevent that. But uh, we have our tearaway. We have... Um, batting, which I'm not going to be uh, using for this particular one, uh, cork fabric, um, as well as embroidery threads, matching bobbin, uh, and that's an important point because we want our bobbin thread to match the top thread rather whenever we're doing something that's going to be freestanding, meaning we can see it from both sides because we don't want those white bobbin stitches to be a glaring um, aesthetic no-no, so to speak, once we're complete. Then of course, uh, we just recommend, recommend a 7511 universal needle. That's generally what we use for everything. But when it comes down to stitching on non-woven materials, I mean, this does have a good backing to it, but for non-woven materials such as uh, cork or cardstock or mylar, vinyl, et cetera, having a um, 7511 needle means the gauge of the needle is much thinner 
so it's going to leave smaller holes because you can't just go back afterwards and iron those needle holes shut. Um, so using like a 90 universal isn't going to quite give you the same effect. So we're going to go ahead and just kind of jump right in here and then I'll announce that winner. Oh, we're going to announce the winner at the very end. Okay, perfect. Then we will announce the uh, winner at the very end. So hold on to your seats. Um, likewise, if uh, you tune out, just tune back in at the end to verify if you're a winner as well after the fact. So let's see here. We are on page nine of the tutorial. And I know that you're going to want to gravitate directly to the picture steps if you're new. Picture steps should be used secondary to the number steps, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But we're going to be doing file FMC2. So on page 9, it's the second one from the top. You can see how we always have our picture scanned in so that you can see exactly what you're making. And we're going to be following the number steps. Now this comes in just one size, uh, but I always recommend doing the number steps first. And if you're not familiar with the terminology, that's when you would want to flip back over to the actual picture steps. So the first thing we're going to do is run our placement steps, then place the cork base fabric. So with the need of good design, and I'm just going to go ahead and get that running, um, all of our collections are designed to have a paint by numbers approach. So it's I really can't think of any time where you would be putting a piece of material in the actual hoop without having a marking stitch or a placement stitch in this regard to show you exactly where to put it, which is very handy because now I have this circle stitch for my cork that tells me exactly how much I need to prep. There's also no guesswork as to where I need to put it in the hoop because the registration's right there, stitched onto the stabilizer. So this is also how we applicate. I've already done the embroidery. That's one of our first principal techniques. It's just threading, pulling it up on the screen, pressing go. So that just uh, requires you to have some familiarity with your machine. So um, if you are brand new and you need some of those instructions, I'd recommend just contacting the dealer that you got it from. So with applique, it always has a few steps. And this is our way of recreating the traditional look of applique that you would either do by hand traditionally or maybe just on a machine, but not electronic embroidery. So our way of doing it with the paint by numbers approach is we have a placement stitch for our applique. Anytime it's an applique, the material goes right side up. Now this cork is, does rather have a right side and a wrong side. So it's a directional piece of material. Um, I'm just lightly taping it here just to keep it secure while we tack it down. And I'm gonna run step two, which is going to be the tacking stitch. And I want you to notice how those instructions in the actual number steps say wait to trim. So, and I'll explain why here in just a bit. So the tacking stitch is usually going to be a two-ply, meaning it's gonna go back over its stitch twice to help secure it. That way it doesn't shift while we're doing additional embroidery on top. It also uh, will really keep it from drawing in until we do the final satin stitch at the end, which is what we're going to cover this particular freestanding applique with. All right. So we noticed it said wait to trim. So now we are on step three. I can see on my machine, coordinates perfectly with the number steps in your instruction tutorial. Step three, it's telling me K33. That's just the um, uh, color thread that we used, but you can use anything. This is an abstract design, so I'd recommend coordinating whatever thread colors you want with the color cork you pick. So I'm gonna go ahead and just switch it up to this orange one here. And while I'm re-threading this, let me go ahead and mention our flash sale. So I don't have a picture of it, so I would entice you to go onto the website. Oh, never mind. They found one. Good job, Kaden. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the pumpkin doilies is a flash sale today. You can go online and get it right now. 50% off, right? So I don't lie to them again. It'll be 50% off now because I just announced it publicly. So 50% off <laughs> pumpkin doilies. Uh, these are very simple projects. It's just water soluble and thread and you just press go, let it do all the work for you, rinse it away at the end and you can do whatever you'd like with these. You can create, um, stitch a bunch together to create placemats, table runners, put them on shirts, pillows, whatever you'd like. So that flash sale is going now and it originally came out in August 
of 2019 for those of you who have been in all access and are wondering if you're going to buy it for the third time <laughs> in a row. All right. So got my next thread ready to go. <clears throat> and we're running step three, if you're following along. So when I mentioned um, that step two said wait to trim, what that means is because this is not a woven material, as the stitch density starts to draw in, it can pull along the material and kind of pull it into where the embroidery area is. Normal fabrics that have a little bit of a stretch because it's a weave can handle that a good bit more, but if it's a non-woven material, it really doesn't have any stretch or give to it at all, meaning it can, as it draws in, kind of pull material through the tack down stitch and into the design, which is fine. That's why we left it to trim. But if I went ahead and trimmed it and it drew in, it would just pull it into the satin or into rather the tack down stitch and I'd have a little gap. So this um, stitch density, meaning the number of stitches in this design for the area it's doing it in, uh, really isn't that much. So you could trim right now, but it's just, if you're new, a good practice to go ahead and do it. And eventually you'll kind of pick up on all those little nuances. All right, so step three is done. We're gonna move on to step four, which is the lavender decorative stitching. Or excuse me, I apologize. I was reading the uh, next file. Step four is going to be the blue decorative, but I'm just gonna use purple. Like I said, I'm not even using the same color um, cork as in the picture. We're not even using the same color threads. The only reason we really put colors in for most of our designs is so that you have a point of reference visually looking at the picture to know exactly what we're saying is going to stitch out. All right. It's going to run step four. So um, uh, just to get back to what I was talking about with trimming, that's a uh, one reason why we say wait to trim, but another point I was bringing up is that it's always good to go back and reread the previous step you just did before you continue with the next. Because if, um, for instance, I was doing a really long embroidery run, maybe it took 30 minutes until my next step, I might forget that there was something I was supposed to do before I continued on. So I always recommend going back and rereading. Now to touch on those picture steps and to touch on how the tutorials work, since this guy's running for a few, let me get this off the screen real quick. There we go. Um, so we went over the front of the tutorial with your materials list. This one dives straight into the picture steps. So these are extremely handy. Oh, I see now. I'm hiding it behind the, the, the pip. <laughs> so the uh, pictures in here, are lettered, they're not numbered. They're not going to coordinate with the actual number steps on your actual machine. The reason is, is because when it tells you to like lay down your cork, the machines actually don't do that. And that's something you're doing by hand. So it's not a machine step. So the actual picture steps, when you move past them, that's why I always recommend starting with the number steps. And when you're confused as to the terminology like tacking stitch, wait to trim, well, one, what is a tacking stitch? What does that even mean? You're able to flip back, and you can see now C is showing you then run the next machine step, which will attach the base fabric. So that is how you could reference back to the picture for more clarification. And then, of course, uh, once you get through, going through the different number steps and everything, past that is typically recommendations for other collections that use a similar technique. So um, for the past several years, almost all of our tutorials are structured like this, either through our event education materials <clears throat> or just for stuff that you buy online. Uh, we don't try to reinvent the wheel. We've been doing education for a very long time and we've learned a lot by doing in-person events. And we've always tried to get even better at how we explain things, but when we find something really works, we don't try to just restructure the whole thing for no reason. Okay, so now we're on to step five, which is more of the embroidery. I'm gonna switch up and do some of this light blue on here. All right. Now, when I mentioned um, in the beginning 
about how corks, when they are dyed, may not be color fast, meaning uh, with um, water and stuff on them, or condensation in this case, if you have like a cold drink sitting on the coaster, um, it can cause it to bleed a little. Now, the bleed effect from the top really isn't anything, but when we originally used cork to make these coasters a long time ago, I remember that I had taken one and put it on my desk, put a drink on it, and you know the top and the bottom both had this dyed cork on it. Well, the bottom of it, that condensation bled through and bled the cork onto the desk. So I'll tell you another trick so that you don't need to use this cork for the actual bottom of it. Uh, because I believe it, it works and serves its purpose best for the aesthetic, which is what you're seeing on the top. Uh, when I was in uh, Corvallis, Oregon, uh, six, seven years ago, long time ago, uh, one of the ladies in the crowd when I did this at an event, and it was one of the uh, seven projects I taught at that event, um, she had mentioned that instead of having to use more cork, not only because it's expensive, but because, again, if it has a dye, it can bleed. Um, instead of having to use more cork at the bottom, she said, hey, you know those uh, plastic vinyl table covers that have the fuzzy bottom on them? She said that she would take those and just cut it out and have the plastic side facing the inside of the actual cork coaster and the fuzzy part as the bottom. So it not only protects from um, water and condensation coming through because of that uh, vinyl lining, but it also helps protect any furniture you put it on because of the soft backing. So I thought that was a really good um, use for something that you might not have even thought about. So just to throw that out there. All right. Now, uh, something else that's going on online right now is that all of our singles are 15% off through the 11th. So starting right now, you can go on, you can get any of our single collections, 15% off through the 11th. Take advantage of that as well. Um, the discount is at checkout. Okay. On to the final decorative embroidery step. I think I'll switch it back up and use some orange. Let me see here. Actually, maybe I should look at my number steps. I'm so used to just looking at the screen and reading the uh, digitizing um, preview screen of what's about to stitch next. So step six that we're on is the tacking stitch for the back fabric. Then we're going to trim both sides. So now, as I mentioned, you want to go back and read the previous steps. So we just did step five, which was the final decorative step. That one said, uh, you know, orange decorative stitching, then place your cork fabric on the back. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we're just gonna take our hoop out of the machine without removing the actual project from the hoop. We're gonna flip it upside down. Then when we put our cork down, the cork is going to go right side up relative to how you have the hoop facing. Oh, I've got the tape already. Somebody set me up for success. All right. So what I like to do whenever I'm taping something on the back of the hoop is to tape the corners. Reason being is if you're using a home machine and uh, not a multi-needle, but a regular home machine like the one I'm running, it is rubbing the bottom of that hoop onto the actual bed and any loose corners can grab and pull. Same thing with the tape, any loose tape can grab and pull. So you really want it to look like that on the back of the hoop. So you can see I got the corners taped. I made sure that all my tape is pressed completely flat so there are no lips of anything to grab onto once we do that. So um, obviously I'm using way more cork than necessary for this, but those placement stitches at home will allow you to say, hey, I only need this big of a square, or maybe you have a um, scan and cut type of machine. All right, let me go ahead and put in this final black thread. Um, I'm gonna use a black thread, not only for the tack stitch, but for my final stitch as well, as soon as I can find the beginning of it. There we go. Um, the reason I like using the same color thread to do a tack down prior to a satin stitch that's going to cover it is because the satin stitch coverage may not be 100%. You know, those satin stitches are side by side to create a channel of stitching. And you might get a starkly contrasting thread. Probably helps if I actually feed it through the needle. 
you might get a starkly contrasting thread peek through those satin stitches, which just isn't aesthetically pleasing as people would like. All right. Always remember to thread the needle <laughs> if it wants to be thread. So in the comments, I'd like to know from everyone, how many of you have made our court coasters or coasters in general by any good design? Because you can kind of see how fast this project is going. And this is one of the reasons why I say it makes a great gift. You know, we have a saying that you need a good design. Not everyone is quilt worthy. So you're not going to be making a queen size quilt for everyone in the office. He's not going to appreciate it. But these little gifts right here are perfect. They're quick to run, and you can multiply them in bigger hoopings. If you have a multi-needle, then you can actually set a lot of this up to just go ahead and run um, multiples at a time in a larger hooping to really batch out your gifts. You can even do it on the home machine. You just, you know, have to manually uh, rethread. Something else um, I wanted to mention was that when we are doing appliques in general, you know, I mentioned this in the beginning, but we had our, our placement stitch that showed me where to actually put the um, applique for this because that, that's technically what it is. All this is is an applique. We're just making it a freestanding applique by covering the back of it. And we also put this on last so that none of those lock or bobbin stitches would be sticking out in the back and fraying and all that. So it makes it look even prettier on both sides. But um, all of this is applique, so it's just that placement stitch. We went ahead and put it right side up. It tacked it down, and that's all there is to applique. Eventually you're going to trim it, but how you trim it is determined by the finishing stitch. Since this is a satin stitch, I'm gonna trim as close as I can to the tack down. If it were a raw edge, I'd leave a little bit out, ragged edge even more, and then I might clip it. So there's different applications of applique, but the principal technique is just that placement stitch, fabric right side up, tack it in place. Anything else that happens after that is just embroidery. There's very few rules to know beyond that. And in terms of principal techniques, there's only four. There was the embroidery that I touched on, the applique that we just learned, as well as folded fabric, and folded fabric is our way of replicating, um, or recreating rather, paper piecing or hand piecing, traditional kinds of uh, folded edges that you would see within quilts or in designs in general or uh, clothing. But instead of having to go through all that work and have to ha having rather to have an advanced to at least intermediate level of skill, you're able to actually do it very quickly and have it look professional the very first time, even if it's your first time using a machine because I have no idea how to do any of this. The only reason Steve hired me is because I was able to talk in front of people and then he goes, yeah, we'll teach you the rest, it'll be fine, which they did because I just learned with the same educational curriculum that all of you get to learn from as well. I didn't have to attend some super secret training seminar deep in the woods for four days or anything like that. It was just me in front of the machines, running them to make all these different samples, helping create all the diff different design packs. And after about, you know, a couple weeks of doing that, I could literally teach any class anything because the method to completion is that simple. The only real thing you need to know beyond that is just how to do a straight stitch because when you're combining any of our stuff, that's all we're doing is a straight stitch. So I'll show you the front of this and how close I trimmed, which you can see there. So beyond the actual, the tack down is about here. I maybe have a 16th inch at most sticking out past that. That means my satin stitch will completely cover any of the raw edges that are left so that it looks nice and pretty when you're finished and there's not any fabric kind of sticking out. So same thing on the back. We're going to go ahead and trim that up. We can remove the tape. And when it comes down to uh, you know, the particular notion I'm using to trim um, is my favorite kind of applique scissors or scissors in general for just general trimming, which is a double curve tip. 
So I have the curve on the handle and the curve at the tip. The curve at the tip prevents me from actually, if I have a really complicated applique cut, well, a straight tip, when I'm trying to get into a tight curve, will just kind of punch through the tack down and it's kind of annoying to really get in intricate cuts. The curve tip deflects away from where you don't want to cut, making it much easier to do so. And the curve on the handle keeps my hand up off the hoop so I'm not punching it while I'm trying to cut it. Um, everybody has their own preference. Um, in fact, a, a lot of the people on the floor prefer like snips or um, smaller, just single curve tip. I just like the double because my hand does punch the hoop. <laughs> and I have knocked things out of the hoop trimming before, which is frustrating when you're halfway through a two hour embroidery run project, like if you're doing a tile scene or something, where there's tons of embroidery on the surface. But thanks to us, the only thing you have to do to get that embroidery to look perfect is follow the directions and change your thread. All right, so I've got this finishing up here. Now I do have a uh, navy, dyed cork and yes I am going to use a black thread around the edge which is a faux pas to some people but I like black and navy together I don't think it looks bad depends how you pull it off <laughs> all right sorry I didn't mean to knock on the <laughs> table that the mic's sitting on <laughs> boom just blew everybody out all right <laughs> if you're not awake you are now Okay, so I'm gonna bring the screen back out of sleep mode. I'm gonna run this uh, final step here, which I'm uh, going ahead and just looking back at my number steps. This is a habit I had to get into because I am a bull in a china shop and I will barrel through things without looking at them twice. Uh, and then you tend to miss stuff, which I did quite a bit when I first started. So rereading the previous step six, you know, we did that tacking stitch for the back fabric. We trimmed the front and the back. Now we're ready for our satin finishing stitch. This is the final step to complete one single cork coaster. Now as that's running, I'm going to go touch on a couple other things. Um, for one, when I mentioned that you know you learn embroidery and you learn applique today, the thing I mentioned for a flash sale, those pumpkin doilies for instance, all that is is embroidery. There's no applique. Sometimes we'll put um, like organza into a freestanding lace design, whether it's a doily, whether it's um, uh, you know a decoration that you hang, and, but that's just applique at that point. And the reason I like to bring that up, and the reason I like to bring up, sorry, one piece of thread was annoying me. The reason I like to bring up that there's just four principal, four core techniques for anything you do in a needed good design is because the range of what we create on a monthly basis looks like it's enormous. It's, it actually looks very overwhelming when in fact it's extremely simple. When you realize that you're only doing four techniques to create anything within our entire catalog of Anita Good Design from the past, well since 2004, it really opens you up to knowing and giving you the confidence to go ahead and get whatever you want, dive right in, and beyond that Unless you have to stitch something together like a quilt or if you're making a uh, tote bag with a bunch of blocks, even those patterns still use quilt blocks as the foundation. So learning the quilt block technique, the folded fabric technique, applique and embroidery allow you to do everything. You just have to know how to straight stitch. And to talk about that, we have videos that literally show you how to sew everything together, how to do binding, all that stuff. So if you're not already subscribed to our YouTube channel, then please go ahead and subscribe. Once you click subscribe, click that notification bell. That way, whenever we come out with new videos, new education, uh, promotions of things that you might be really excited about, you will get that notification sent to whatever you like, whether it's um, you know notification on your phone or email, etc. And then finally, make sure you, uh, of course, like, but comment below too. The more you engage with us, the more it opens us up and puts us out there to other people in the community so that they can become a part of the Anita Good Design tribe as well. That way you have more people and more ideas to comment with and learn from in the comments. And a lot of people, when we do in-person events, they love the camaraderie, making friends, bouncing ideas off of one another. That's what the comment section is here for you as well. So again, like, subscribe, click the notification bell, comment below, tell all your friends. <laughs> And then uh, finally, since I did bring up that there's really only four techniques that you need to learn, if that's getting you excited 
and making you feel more empowered. Once you start doing a couple of these basic, easy entry level type of design packs, you're probably gonna find yourself going online to buy a lot more. Well, you're gonna find that we actually have a club program where you get all of our retail releases every single month bundled with a minimum of 80% off and that's called our all access club program. So if that's something that's interesting to you because if you go online and you buy about one to two designs a month, you're already spending more than you would to be a member with a 12 month subscription. Every single month you get a beautiful book with all the tutorials of everything that was released. So on the back here, that is the entire month's release. Actually, let me pull it back because it's not focused. So that's the entire month's release for September. And you can see on the back here, shows you all the different designs that come in there. Every single design pack has all the designs included, every tutorial fully printed, all in here for you, including all the scanned pictures, um, tips and tricks, uh, the picture steps, number steps, everything, all right there. And you'll be saving a ton, mainly because this big release, Wonderwood, it's I believe about a hundred bucks online. You could get a club membership if you just did digital only, you'd still get everything we release and it would be half the cost of just buying one of these things. So just putting that out there. This is gonna become a hobby of yours. We want to make it as affordable to you as possible and as exciting as possible. All right. So now we have finished the court coaster and you can see on both sides how when we wound the bobbin, it coordinates with the front. And then what do you do? Well, on tear away, you don't have to do much. You can just kind of punch it out of your hoop and then it just comes right out. So what are we on to next? Perfect. All right, back to that giveaway that we announced at the beginning. Judy Harrison. Judy Harrison, you are the winner of our $20 gift card. Congratulations. If you'll go ahead and just shoot an email over to customer experience at anita goodesigncom Excuse me. Yeah, dashgooddesign.com. I don't know why I just forgot our email. And then they'll go ahead and send you that digital gift card number so you can go ahead and use it for shopping on our website to get anything that's a standard retail product. Congratulations. And I know we have some uh, Q&A as well. Right. So Mary Bell asked, what can you use inside to make the cork leak-proof? Leak-proof. So um, Mary Bell, was that, did I say her name correctly? Mm -hmm. uh, was asking, what can we use inside the cork coaster to make it leak-proof? There's a couple different things. So if um, you've been uh, watching and need a good design for a while, or if you have a bunch of our products, then you know that we like playing with like clear vinyl. Uh, kind of like what my grandparents would put on the couch when I come over, but not quite that thick. A medium eight gauge vinyl is all you need, but I could actually, before I put on whatever I was gonna do on the back, because again, I wouldn't recommend using dyed cork on the back, um, then I would uh, put the, imagine that the tearaway still in here. You know, we flipped it over, we're ready to put on our back fabric. Well, first I would just put some of that clear vinyl down because that's going to be a very good moisture barrier. That uh, vinyl tablecloth I mentioned earlier with the fuzzy back, you know how cheap those are and that vinyl doesn't quite have the best moisture protection, but it's a cheap alternative. But so is clear vinyl because you can actually tack that inside and then whatever I use on the back, whether it's even just a piece of minky or something like that, that will completely seal from any moisture seeping through. And also just to touch on uh, colors bleeding, you can get non-dyed cork and you won't have any issue with that. All right. Are these designs available on All Access or are they exclusive to Watch and Stitch? Yes, so the Watch and Stitch designs are an education type of content. Our All Access is all standard retail content. For instance, when you get your All Access book on the back here, um, anything that would be education, like our um, Anita's Universities that we've done, our Watch and Stitch, any of that stuff is its own separate category that is not a part of All Access. All Access is all the regular releases we do on a monthly basis, so Watch and Stitch is not included, just like our event curriculums are not included, if that makes sense. Good, perfect, all right. Well, if you have uh, any other questions or comments, customer experience at 
anita-gooddesign.com is where to go. If you decide that you looked more into that club program and you want to sign up, be sure to put Brian in the order notes and also contact customer experience if you have any questions on more info or what that involves or what it looks like. So once again, this is Brian with Anita Good Design. Thank you for tuning in to another Watch and Stitch and we'll see you at the next one.